semester teaching here was in the fall of 1986. So I've actually been here 25 years, although there were a couple of years where I didn't teach. There were gaps in that. I don't have 25 years of service. And as you know that know me here, they reward me with the finest office on the entire campus, the broom closet next door to the abandoned bathroom. Um, this is going to be a talk about the internet, but I want to be specific about something. It's not a particularly technical talk. We're going to go into a couple of technical things, and we'll try to explain them as we get to them. Uh, this is mostly going to be about people and ideas and how things came together in a certain way. So what we're going to start with is how far have we, well, he told me that would work, oh well. How far have we gotten, there we go. Does everybody know who Mark Zuckerberg is? That's not Mark Zuckerberg, right. by the way. Who is Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> yeah, the person who created Facebook. This is a guy who uh, works for Google in Egypt. His name is Wild Gonim. I think I'm saying that roughly correctly. And he was interviewed by Wolf Blitzer last month. And he was one of the people that brought together the Egyptian public who created the bloodless revolution that led to uh, Mubarak, quote unquote, resigning. If you believe that, hmm? Oh, I don't know what to do about light. What? Try those. Is that better? OK. And the point of this slide, he's crediting Facebook, a website that runs on a service called the World Wide Web that sits on top of this thing called the internet. And he's giving that credit for bringing people together to change a society. The people who created the internet starting in the 1960s did not foresee this day coming. I've talked to a few of them. They knew they were on to something. They didn't know it would lead to this. Here's how our talk's going to go today at a high level. We'll spend more time talking about the things that you seem more interested in. If I see a bunch of people yawning, we'll speed that part of it up. We're going to talk about networking in general, which doesn't have anything to do with computers. It will. But networking predates computers. The idea of a network is very, very ancient. Um, we're going to talk about how the computer came about. All these things will be at a high level, because we only have the most part of an hour. I can't go into great detail about any of these things. When the first computers came around, they were horrible to try to use. We'll describe this a little bit, and I'll show you a couple of pictures. We had to make them easier to use. We had to make the computer something that people could actually sit in front of and do something with, which the early ones were mostly not. We also had to figure out how to get the computers to talk to each other, which is harder than it sounds like. Now, those of you that are much younger than me, you've never known a time when the computers couldn't talk to each other. But they used to not be able to, and we'll talk a little bit about how that went. Now, these two things, to those of you that know this story, look like they're backwards. This is really a subtopic, those of you that know what DARPA stands for. We're going to talk about the internet itself, what it is and what it isn't. DARPA, which was a government agency that was sort of its predecessor, uh, we're getting to the point where we'll bring our talk into the 1980s and when for the first time you can actually have a computer in your house. And I remember in the early days one of the big questions that I always had about this was why in the world would you want to have a computer in your house? Uh, I'm not that much of a luminary. The person who was at the time the president of IBM wondered why anybody would have a computer in their house. And then finally we get to where people using computers can communicate with each other and we have this wonderful thing that we have today where an Egyptian revolutionary can want to shake hands with a guy named Mark Zuckerberg, and you know who that is. Networking in general predates computers. This is a map of St. Clair County, which is where I live, off the St. Clair County GIS website. Uh, this is not the entire county. This is a part of it. This shows two separate networks on this map. In the sort of reddish-brown lines that are all over the map, that's a network of roads. Very ancient thing to build a network of roads. The Romans had an extensive network of roads. There's also a network on this map that predates even the roads. We made the roads. We were the second network builders. God made the rivers and streams and drains. You see here the Bell River, probably the Pine River up here, all these interconnected streams and brooks leading into these rivers. Um, these are important because 
to us, in order for society to advance, people have to be able to share ideas. There's only two ways for people to share ideas. The people either have to be in the same room like you and I are now, or they have to be able to move either the people or the ideas from place to place. Now, most of the great advances in society have come for bad reasons. A lot of our technological advances come from military necessity. If you're in the army, and I'm in the army, and there's an enemy between you and I, and I want to talk to you, there's two ways to do it. I can go where you are, or I can somehow get the information to you without me moving. Me going to where you are in that circumstance is a little bit risky. The enemy might object, and that could cause problems for me. So we developed this notion, humankind developed this notion a long time ago, that it was easier and cheaper to move ideas than to move people. Now, how did this get started? One of the earliest forms of communication technology was the smoke signal. Now, you could watch a film in which there were smoke signals, and all you would see is smoke. Someone who's versed in smoke signalese might watch a movie about smoke signals and might be able to understand the message. Drink Coca-Cola, or whatever they would send over smoke signals. Why is it that I would watch that movie and I would see nothing but smoke, but the person sitting next to me might watch that movie and might understand what's being communicated? Why is that? I don't have the code. The smoke signals have to mean something. We have to agree, whoever wants to communicate using the smoke signals has to agree what the different smoke signals will mean. We have to have some way of translating what our message is to smoke signals. We're going to talk about those kinds of conventions, those agreements, and this is more broad a word than I use in a computer science class, but we're going to talk about those, we're going to call those protocols. A protocol, a protocol is just an agreement between you and I that a certain thing is going to be interpreted in a certain way. That's all a protocol is. Now, one of the difficulties with communication in general is that it doesn't work very well. Have any of you ever played the game of telephone? I was thinking about doing it here, but it's going to take too much time. So I'm going to play an imaginary game of telephone. Imagine that I line half of you up down that wall, and I line the other half of you up down that wall, and I repeat a message, 15 or 20 words, very quietly to the person in the front of each line. I would have to get a volunteer to do this, because I can't speak quietly. That person's job is to turn around and repeat in a whisper the message to the person behind him. Then her job is to communicate to the person behind her and so on. What happens when you get to the end of the line? The person in the back of the line reads aloud the message he or she received and what typically happens. The message is incorrect. Yeah, the message is garbled. Parts of it are lost. Words are changed. There's a reason for that. The space between me and you, you and the next person, is a communications channel. Any communication channel works some percent of the time. Any communication channel works some percentage of the time. Now, the good news is, on any reasonable communications channel, it's a positive percentage. You wouldn't call it a communications channel at all if it simply never worked. Uh, a counterexample of this would be the old Soviet telephone system. Unfortunately for us, for those of you that are in the math biz with me, that's strict inequality right there, it's never 100% effective. We always lose information. We always distort information. Information is never sent completely reliably. That's going to be one of the things we're going to have to overcome. A slightly more modern form of communication technology that came around in the 19th century, credit for the invention was given by, uh, to a guy by the name of Morse, was the telegraph. I have a telegraph station, which is a little electrical gizmo running on a, what you'd look at now and think of as a car battery. Some number of miles away, you have a similar gizmo, and there's a wire between my gizmo and your gizmo. 
And as I tap the thing, it creates little electrical pulses that cause little clicks to happen at your end. And the big improvement in telegraphy was when the clicks were changed to a tone. So we have this method of communicating now using a series of four different signals. The four different signals are a short tone, a long tone, a short silence, and a long silence. And there's a protocol governing how we interpret these mixtures of short and long tones and silences. And the protocol that was used in America, I say was because very few people know this anymore, is called Morse code. So Morse code is just a convention that we can picture these like this. Obviously, whoops. What just happened? There we go. Apparently, one of the protocols is not working perfectly today. You see that's a communications channel with less than 100% reliability. That represents a long tone. That represents a short tone, a short silence, and a long silence. And if you know Morse code, this would actually sound out as beep, beep, beep. And that, to a Morse code aficionado, is the word Detroit. Now, the D is not capitalized, you may have noticed, because one of the things Morse code doesn't happen to allow for is capital letters. American Morse code also doesn't allow for any of the European characters that don't exist in the English language. So American Morse code doesn't have any vowels with umlauts or French letters with accent marks or any of that. There was an international version that included all of those things. And it was an alphabetic code. Whoops, I thought I had a slide for this, but I don't. So for example, in Morse code, one short and two long represents the letter D. One dot represents the letter E. Now, Morse code was efficient. One dot represents the letter E, Y. It's the most frequently used letter in English, so it was the quickest signal to send. The same thing happened years later when direct long distance dialing was invented and the phone company in the United States, Bell, implemented it. The area code for New York City was 212. The area code for the Upper Peninsula of Michigan was 906. Now, there were no touch-tone phones at this, in these days. You had to dial, and the dial created a series of electrical pulses. The one created one pulse, the zero created 10 pulses. So to dial the area code for New York City, the telephone company had to pay for the electricity to generate five electrical pulses. To dial the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the telephone company had to pay five times as much. It cost the phone company five times as much before touch tone, now it's all even, for you to call the Upper Peninsula of Michigan than it did to call New York City. So why would they have assigned these area codes in that way? Financial reasons. More people are calling vastly. More people are calling nothing against the Upper Peninsula, by the way. It just happens to be a big, long area code that I know off the top of my head. Vastly more people are dialing into New York City than are dialing into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So you can craft the codes to be efficient at handling the expected traffic. Now, if you're going to send an encrypted message in Morse code, Morse code becomes inefficient. Because the letter E, which you're going to want to send very frequently, gets translated into some other letter like X that doesn't have a particularly efficient. Now, we have communications technology. It'll, it'll get better, you'll see. Now we need the computer. This is a device that's being built in England today. It was invented in the 19th century. Well, invented might be too strong a word. By a guy named Charles Babbage. Babbage succeeded with great difficulty in building a calculator that could do things that mechanical calculators of his day could not do. And he actually invented on paper something pretty close to a computer. He called it his analytical engine. Uh, he was propped up by a uh, patroness, Lady Lovelace, uh, and 
The difficulty he ran into is he needed precision in manufacturing the parts for this thing, and the manufacturing technology of the day just was not up to the task. He invented something that could not be built. And in the 1990s, a team of uh, scientists in England started trying to recreate the analytical engine. And I don't happen to know right at the moment how far they've got because they haven't returned my emails. But if they're using this to, to read the emails, I can understand why they're not returning my emails. Now, as long as it keeps coming back, I don't mind. The, the interruptions in the slide are not a problem. Now, the modern electronic computer, this, this would have been a steam-powered computer, by the way, uh, got its start in the days leading up to the war, World War II, which people my age call the war. None of the other ones mattered. The English almost had the first computer. The English had a place called Bletchley Park where they were able to break a lot of the German code so they could read the German military traffic that was going over the radio. And they had built enormous electronic machinery. Do I have a picture of this? No, I don't. They had built enormous electronic machinery to accomplish this that looked very much like old-fashioned telephone switchboards. If you go to Greenfield Village, they've got an old telephone switchboard from the Hudson's department store in downtown Detroit. Imagine 500 of those stacked in every possible direction. And that's what the uh, almost a computer that the English had built uh, looked like. The only reason I don't give it credit, and most historians don't give it credit for being a computer, is it was designed to do only one thing, crack German codes. It wasn't general purpose. And those of us in the computer biz, we require that a computer be a general purpose device. You have to be able to change it to do the next thing you might want it to do. The computers almost at Bletchley Park were wonderful at cracking the German codes. But to get them to do any other thing whatsoever would have been a monstrous task. Now, the actual first computer was built by a German student during the war. But at some point in the war, we blew it up. So there's, there's not records of it. We don't know exactly what it could do. We don't know how it was built. It was built by a guy named Conrad Zeus. Uh, so unfortunately, even though he had the first computer, it blew up. And there wasn't any good documentation about it. There weren't any patents filed for it. So he sort of gets lost in history. And instead, we give the credit to uh, two guys in America, Eckert and Mochley. Make sure I've got those names correct. The first actual functioning general purpose computer, ENIAC, which was at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and was first working in 1946. So this is the first time we actually have something that'll come back that we would think of today as a computer. Well, maybe it'll come back. There it is. I really would like to know what is causing that. But anyhow, the technology of the first computer was vacuum tubes. And the vacuum tubes had a pathetic shelf life. One of the difficulties with early computers is they just failed constantly, as opposed to now. Um, the, there were some other difficulties that got into them. Uh, you know, Mike, you know where the word bug comes from. We call a problem with a computer program a bug. And the etymology of using the word bug in that way came from a woman named Grace Hopper, who worked for the uh, Navy, I believe it was. It was a rear admiral in the Navy. and ran into a situation where her computer that she had failed. And when it fails, you have to just check all of the vacuum tubes to see which one's burnt out. There are 19,000 of them. It takes a while. And uh, she didn't find that any of them had burnt out. You can tell when you're looking at vacuum tubes that they're burnt. Uh, one of the people working for her noticed that a moth had flown in behind the tube and had gotten its wings pinned to the two terminals and was short circuiting them. So the first bug in a computer was a bug in a computer. And now we just use it to generally mean a flaw. But it really was a bug. Um, ENIAC was a very slow computer by today's standards, uh, remarkably slow. Uh, since it was the first computer, it didn't have one of the problems we're going to talk about next, which is how do computers communicate, just like the person who had the first telephone. Not very useful. <laughs> you, build, you make the first telephone, you've got to sit around and wait for somebody to make the second telephone. But this was the first device that could actually communicate with people at all. Now, how did it communicate? You fed the computer instructions in the early days by rearranging plugs on plug boards. These people looked like telephone operators, because that's what they were. 
they were hired because they knew how to operate these plug boards. They were given instructions as to what plug boards did what how. Um, pretty soon that got tedious because you always had to have telephone operators working for you. And uh, so they changed it. And the next uh, breakthrough in the communication between the human and the computer was invented a long time ago by a guy in Buffalo, New York called Herman Hollerith. Those of you that have been in the computer business for a long time, you've used thousands of these. We don't use them much anymore. They were originally invented to be sold to the United States Bureau of the Census. This was an electrical device that had hundreds and hundreds of little pins. You punched holes in the card. The holes represented something. There was a protocol that told you what the holes represented. And when you pulled this lever down over the top of the card, where there was a hole, the pin could drop through and complete an electrical circuit. Where there was no hole, the cardboard prevented the pin from going through, and no circuit was completed. He got the idea for this from watching heavier ones of these that were used in mechanized weaving equipment since the 1700s. So the essential first reasonable method of commu communicating with a computer goes back to the 1700s. Now, the people operating the looms never thought about using that for a computer. This is the beauty of this whole talk. Who cares what they designed it for? It doesn't matter what you designed it for. It matters what it can do. So this is a little bit difficult to work with. Those of you that worked with cards in the old days remember this. These things were sort of a pain. Uh, and you learned some tricks, because you would punch the wrong hole sometime. We had, Mike and I had hanging chads years before the 2000 presidential election. And what you learned was this little bit of mucilage. You could paste the chad back into the hole to fix the card, because you had to buy the cards. They weren't given away for free. And the people that operated the computers hated when you did that because the cards that had glue on the back of them would get stuck in the readers and cause all sorts of havoc. Oh, I did. I did. So this, this was a better technology than having telephone operators moving wires around and plugging RCA jacks into boards. But the average person could never be expected to use this type of technology. Now, how did the computer communicate back? There were blinking lights on the computer. And the light being on meant something, and the light being off meant something. That sounds archaic, but you use that today all the time. I'm going to make a bunch of little circles. If you see that bunch of little circles on the bank sign on your bank, what does that look like to you? You've been able, you've been using this long enough to know this is what a six looks like in lit up light bulb language. The protocol. The lights form an approximation of the number six and your brain fills in the rest. And so this is better than what you had with the early computers. The lights were just in rows and columns and each light meant some specific thing and you had to know what the lights meant. It was rather barbaric to communicate with the computer, so it had to get better. And that's the next subject, improving the computer-human interface. The first great improvement came from Western Union. Western Union is a, a company that's still around, but it no longer does what it was once famous for. Western Union is now a company that charges you money to give money to somebody. That's amazing. Who thought of that? Right? That's a brilliant business idea. What was Western Union's business for 130 years, though? Telegrams, sending telegrams. What was a telegram? In the very early days of Western Union, it was a telegraph. You brought a message to a Western Union telegraph operator. They telegraphed out in Morse code the message to a telegraph op uh, operator at the other end. That person wrote down the message and handed it to your intended recipient. Much faster than the mails. Much more expensive than the mails. Western Union, as soon as they could, improved upon this to reduce their labor cost. Morse code is time consuming. To make the sending and receiving faster, Western Union had some companies create these things that were called teleprinters. Tele, far away, printing. You would type your message here. Usually it was set up so that it would copy the message here so that you could see what you had typed. But it would transmit the message down the telegraph lines to far away, where the teleprinter at the other end would receive the message with no one sitting here typing. It would just print the message. Well, we figured out in the mid-1950s that these things could be connected to computers. And it would be a much easier way of sending information into the computer than punching holes in pieces of cardboard. Much more intuitive 
to type in English or whatever your language was, and the computer would spit back out messages that were in a language tantalizingly close to English. That if you knew, if you knew how to read the messages, you could understand what the computer was saying. Much better than having lots of little blinking lights. So this was the first big improvement, the teleprinter. The next big improvement, and for the internet, absolutely critical. This is a guy called Doug Engelbart. This picture was taken in 2008. He's still around. He's doing fine. In the 1960s, in the early 1960s, he took a block of wood, carved an opening into it, and put a child's rubber play ball into it, and developed some sensors that could keep track of the ball moving. Now, the one that's pictured there was a preliminary prototype where he used a disc instead of a ball. But very quickly, he developed that the disc was going to be very limiting because the disc could only take one of those Dyson vacuum cleaner commercials. The ball, much superior technology. The ball, if you have the right number of sensors, how many sensors would that be? Three will get it done. Four will work, too. But three is sufficient to track movement in every possible direction. Modern mice, modern mice usually now only have two. Two is actually sufficient. Uh, three gives you a little bit of redundancy. And if you think back to what I said about vacuum tubes, in the early days of computing, redundancy was a very good thing. When you knew things were going to break constantly, it was good that you always had more of everything than you needed. The whole idea of the mouse doesn't fit in, though, with this teletype. right? We have to have some kind of different technology. Well, you take something that already exists, the typewriter, which was already incorporated in the teletype, then you take another thing, the cathode ray picture tube, which a guy named Dumont had invented in 1920 and became the screen for all the TV sets until 15 or 20 years ago when you started getting different kinds of technologies out there. Every old TV set used cathode ray tube technology. So you've got an invention from the 1920s, cathode ray tube, an invention from the 19th century, the typewriter, electricity. You combine them all and you get, hopefully this is the next slide, whoops what we call a computer terminal. It's got a t this is a very, very early model, the data point 3300. Uh, we had hundreds of these here at the university before personal computers took over this job. A personal computer can do this and more. This is not a computer. It's a typewriter, a cathode ray tube, and some electronics to make it talk to a computer that's somewhere else. It's called a terminal. We coined that name for it, terminal in railroad argot means something at the end of a line. And that's what this was. This was a thing at the end of a wire. So you'd have a computer, and the computer would have bunches of these computer terminals connected to it by wires, which ran up in the ceiling panels all over the campus and everywhere else in the world where people use computers. The big improvement to this over the teleprinter wasn't just that it was faster. It was. It's a lot quicker to draw a screen on a cathode ray tube than to type out at 10 letters per second, a full sheet of paper. That was the speed of the original teletypes. Uh, have you ever seen a movie where uh, Al Capone's guys use machine guns? They don't make the sound that modern machine guns make. A modern machine gun can fire off hundreds of rounds a minute. So a modern machine gun's kind of a <laughs> sound. What did the old Al Capone machine gun sound like? Tat, 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 tat. That's what a teleprinter sounded like when it was working. That was the speed at which it was producing ink on paper. So this was an improvement in terms of speed. But more than that, and this model wasn't able to use it, shortly after this type of terminal, the people making the computer terminals got together with the Doug Inglebarts of the world and figured out how to use the mouse as an attachment to the terminal to move around where you would be entering information. We call that screen addressing. In the old days, you would have a little blinking light at the bottom of the screen called the cursor, and you would type. And as you typed, the cursor would move. And when you reached the end of the line, the line of text you just typed would move up. It would push everything else above it up, and the cursor would stay in the same place. The cursor really didn't move. With addressing, you could take your mouse, and you could put the cursor anywhere you wanted. Now, that was an invention in search of a reason to exist. So now we're going to get into the next point. Because right at this point, we've already got keyboards, screens, and mice. What do we use to communicate with a computer today? Keyboards, screens, and mice. 
Now, every one of those photos that I showed you, except for the recent photo of Doug Engelbart, was taken in the 1960s. So all of the technology we needed to be able to sit at our desk and use the computers the way we use them now is almost 50 years old. Nothing new. The limiting factor at that point was no computer could talk to any other computer. The very first computer talking to computer uh, occurred at IBM. They had two IBM computers of the same make and model standing next to each other. They had a particular type of wire connecting the two, cable actually, technically, connecting the two, and had figured out to put a little piece of software on each computer that could push information over that wire and read it at the other end. But they had to be exactly the same kind of computer in order for that to work. And you had to have them close enough together that you could run a wire between them. So if my computer is in Cleveland and your computer is in Dallas, we're sunk. Now, the Bell Telephone Company, working on this problem for the Department of Defense, invents a device that's rather ingenious. The phone company is a monopoly back in those days, the Bell System, uh, which Lily Tomlin made a career out of making fun of. And the Bell System was funny in a number of ways. They didn't want anything connected to their telephone lines that they hadn't built themselves. And they were absolutely terrified of bad stuff going over the telephone lines. In New York State, it was a misdemeanor to say a swear word into a telephone. Bell got this law passed. They didn't want people cursing on their beloved telephone lines. And everything on the telephone line had to be audio within a certain range of pitches. So the only thing going out over the telephone line is audio. And among the other many nice things about audio, audio has the characteristic that it is an analog thing. There are infinitely many gradations of sound. Now, at one end, you have a computer which is producing digital information, ones and zeros, digital. At the other end, you have a computer which is producing digital information. And if I want to send information from this computer down the telephone line to the other computer, I have to make a connection first, but that's, we don't need to get into that. Assume the computer is able to call up the other computer and that the other computer knows how to answer the phone. We have to convert the digital signal to an audio signal. That process is called modulation. And because a four-syllable Latin word isn't long enough, at the other end, we have to convert the audio signal back to a digital signal. We're undoing this process. So that is called demodulation. So Bell, only a monopoly could do this, called this device a modulator-demodulator a nine-syllable hyphenated word in Latin. The people who used it wouldn't put up with a word that long, so they took the first three letters of each and smacked them together and eliminated the redundant D in the middle, and that's where we get modem from. Now, a modern modem isn't a modem at all, because in 1984, the Bell Telephone Monopoly was broken up under orders of Judge Harold Green in Minneapolis, and all these other phone companies, Sprint and MCI, came along that led us to our Verizons of today. And we now allow digital signals to go directly over the wires. So when you use a what they still call a modem today, it's not doing either of these two things. So it's not really a modem at all. The early modem, this entire thing is the modem, by the way. There's nothing in this picture except the modem, the woman, the sheet of paper, and the lamp. This whole thing, these two boxes, this, that, the two phones, the tape device, all of that's the modem. It was rather unwieldy. That weighed about 400 pounds. It needed to be plugged into two electrical outlets because it used too much electricity for one electrical outlet. But it, by gosh, did the job. The computer at the one end was connected to the computer at the other end, still the same type, and they could talk to each other. Now, we have to get into something a little bit technical. I apologize. The big drawback in terms of us getting to the internet with this computer calling another computer is one computer can only call another computer. When you go on a website, like what's a really common website that people go on? Google. When you log on to Google.com, there is no wire from your computer to Google's computer. There would have to be hundreds of millions of wires going into Google's computer for that to work. And I've never been to Google's place. I just love that na name. 
I've never been to Google's place, but I assume they don't have hundreds of millions of wires running into their computers. What we do instead is we chop up information and we send it out via this path that looks like, and you'll see later, a chain link fence kind of topology. And this, is, this process is called packet switching. The alternative to packet switching is circuit switching. Circuit switching is how phone calls work. You pick up your phone at home, a landline, and you get a dial tone. You're now on a circuit. You dial somebody's phone number, and a set of connected wires connects you to, again, you're calling a landline, that person's phone. You and them occupy that circuit, and up till 30 years ago, nothing else was on that circuit at the same time. You held on to it. That's inefficient for what we want from the internet today. We want everybody to be able to communicate with everybody quickly. So what we do is we do two things. We put these little devices in the middle of the communications channel called routers. In the old days, they were called internet message processors. All it is is it's a little computer that all it knows how to do is send messages back and forth from one computer to another. It's not a general purpose computer itself. It could be made to be. It's just a message handler. The other thing is, remember we talked before about this problem here. If I have a really long message to send out, it's not going to be received correctly. Now, in the old days, a really long message would be a page of text, 800 or 1,000 characters. In modern times, I might be sending a video to a friend of mine, hundreds of millions of characters worth of information. Well, if in sending that hundreds of millions of characters, the computer at the other end doesn't receive it correctly, I now have to resend all hundreds of millions of characters, because I have no way of knowing what part didn't work. So what I do instead is I chop up the message. Let's say we had a message we had to send to a general down the road or to some student of bad literature. I don't remember where this came from. This came from some book. They inherited the earth, and then the army came and scorched it. That's uh, 62 characters counting the spaces. And so I might decide to chop that up into packets of 10 characters each. And as you'll see in a minute, I put a little marker at the end of each packet that allows the person at the other end to know with some high probability that they've received it correctly. So maybe your computer receives correctly 1, 2, and 4, garbles 3 and 5, and doesn't get 6 or 7 at all. Have you ever gotten a multi-box shipment from UPS? You ordered books or something or videos, and it comes in multiple packages? What does it say on the packages? It might say something like box three of five. Why do they do that? Because when you get the boxes, you know whether you've got the whole set or not. Packets have the same information on them. A packet has two parts to it. There's the information in the packet, then there's the information about the packet. This is like when you mail a letter. You never write a letter and put the letter in the mailbox. No one does that. You write a letter, then you put the letter in an envelope. The letter is the content. Now, there's writing all over the envelope. That's not part of your message to your friend. What is the writing all over the envelope for? Why is there writing on the envelope? So the post office knows what the hell to do with the envelope. The post office doesn't care about the message. They just got to deliver the package. Your recipient doesn't really care about the stuff written on the envelope. They just need the message. Packets work the same way. A packet contains two types of information, header, which is the envelope, and content, which is the data. So this packet would not only say they space in her, it would also contain information about who's sending it, who it's being sent to, when it was sent, what the packet number is, how many packets there are, and an extra little tiny piece of information at the end to help you determine whether you got it correctly or garbled. That information, that extra little piece of information is called a packet checksum. It's just a way for the recipient to have a sense of whether they received the packet correctly or not. Here's how it might work. This is not precisely how it really works, but this is the idea of it. You convert every letter to a number. In computer land, that's not necessary. They already are really numbers. You add all the numbers together. You take whatever sum that is, and then you divide that by the number of characters in your alphabet. Now, our fake alphabet here only consists of uppercase letters and space, so there's only 27 things in our alphabet. So we divide by 27 and take the remainder. The remainder is 4. We make that a D, and we append that onto the end of the message. So the message is going to be T-H-E-Y space I-N-H-E-R-D. The D is not part of the message. The D is the checksum. Why is that there? 
because the recipient now can do the same arithmetic, add these together, figure out what the checksum ought to have been, and then look at what the checksum actually is. If this matches what the recipient thought it should be, then there's a high probability, not perfect, but a high probability the message was received correctly. If the checksum is incorrect, the recipient can send a message back to the sender saying, I didn't receive packet one correctly. If the recipient never sees box four of five at all, the recipient, recipient can send a message back saying, I never got packet four at all. Now, it might not even be important that those are two different messages to the sender's point of view. I don't care why you didn't get it. You know, whether you, not, whether you didn't get the message at all or whether you got it but it was garbled, it's the same to me, I have to send it again. So this is a set of techniques by which the computers can keep track of what they're sending to each other. And to give you an example of why we need to break them down, let's say you're sending characters with 99% reliability. If you have to send a thousand character message, there's only a 36% chance the recipient's going to get the thing correctly. If you're sending a hundred thousand character message, it's zero percent down to the third decimal place. Don't bother sending it at all. Whereas if you, if you break it into packets of 10 characters, 90% of those are going to go through correctly on the first try. Therefore, 99% of them are going to go through correctly on the second try. And you can very quickly, just by resending a few packets, reconstruct the complete message. Even if you have 99.99% reliability, which is, which is a very nice reliable communications channel indeed, to send a 100,000 character message, you're back down to 90%. So to send a video, you're here. So to have any chance of the message ever getting across, you have to break it into small enough parts that your communication channel can send it with high degrees of probability. That's the other great thing about the idea of the packet. Now, hold on, I have to look at what this slide is. That would be circuit switching, but why do I have that here? Ah, the messaging part of it, the actual sending of the message. How, when you type www.google.com into your browser, how do the computers know where to go to find google.com? I saw a uh, promotional book that was done by a piano company for Liberace. You all know who Liberace was? A, what's the right word to use here? Flamboyant, will that do? A flamboyant read into that what you will, a pianist who worked in Las Vegas for 160 years. And uh, he was famous enough that you could send him fan mail by addressing it as follows. Liberace, Hollywood, California. He would get that letter. Now, try sending a letter to Scott Anderson, Detroit, Michigan. Problem. Which Scott Anderson? Where is Scott Anderson? The post office wouldn't even handle a letter like that. It's kind of how it actually works in internet land is sort of similar to how it works when you make a phone call. I think I've got some phone calls here on this thing. We're dialing from the university. And let's say I dial, I pick up a phone on campus and I dial 31245. Our, com our phones are connected to a computer somewhere on campus. It used to be in Lansing Riley. I don't know where it is anymore might not even be here on campus, but assume it is. Somewhere on campus, a computer hears the tones for 31245, and it looks in its database, and it says, ah, 31245, that's a campus number. That's mine. I'm going to handle that. Digs a little deeper and says, ah, that's the phone on the front desk at the admissions office. So it sends electricity down that line, and the phone at the front desk of the admissions office rings. Now, let's say, on the other hand, I have a different need than to talk to the admissions office. I pick up the phone a second time, and I dial 9. <coughs> The comma means I wait a second. I don't know why everyone does this. When you pick up a phone, you have to dial 9 for an outside call. You always press the 9, then you wait. You don't have to, but everyone does. It's like not talking in an elevator. And then I dial 8620160. The 9 tells the computer on campus that it can't handle this call, that it has to pass the call off to AT&T. Now, AT&T has a computer somewhere in Detroit that looks at this and says, OK, this is seven digits. So they mean for it to be a call somewhere in Detroit. Let's see if it's something I can handle. Ah, 862, that's the Northwest District. That's me. I can handle that call. 0160, it looks up that and sends uh, electricity down a circuit, and the phone rings at the Coney Island. And Dino answers the phone so that he knows to have my food ready when I get there. 
So in this case, the university's computer did the whole job gate to gate. In this case, the computer had to hand off to another computer. I can't handle this. You've got to handle it. Now let's say, on the other hand, I pick up the phone because I'm really bored, and I dial this phone number because I want to talk to Barack. You notice the Secret Service heard that and <laughs> immediately disabled the whole thing. Now be nice. I pick up the phone and dial 9 again, then this weird string of digits. All of the digits mean something. The 1 means United States and Canada, by the way, World Zone 1. But from the computer's point of view, the university sees the 9 again and says, I can't handle this, passes off to the Detroit AT&T computer. The Detroit AT&T computer says, uh-oh, lots of digits. This might be one of those long distance things. Let's see what to do. It doesn't ever look at this part of the number at all, because it knows it can't handle the call. It looks at the 202 and says, ah, I have to send this to a computer in Washington, DC. Then the computer at Washington, DC gets the call and says, aha, 456, that's the Capitol uh, White House area. And 1414 is the main switchboard at the White House. So here we had one computer handling the call. Here it was probably two. Here it was at least three. Each computer knows to do something with the call, but only the very last one knows where the call actually has to go. The university's computer doesn't have any information about this being the phone number of the White House or about this being the area code for Washington, DC. All the university's computer needs to know is, if you pick up the phone and dial 3, I can handle it. If you pick up the phone and dial 9, I have to give it to somebody else. It's the same way with, web, uh, with the web. If you type on your web browser here at the university anything .udmercy.edu, the computers at the university look at that and say, ah, udmercy.edu, that's me. I should be able to handle this traffic within campus. If you type in google.com, the university's computer says, oh, this is .com, this isn't me. I'll go off to a computer somewhere that knows how to deal with .com. Then that computer looks and says, ah, Google, do I know what that is? Look down my list, yes, I have a thing called Google, I'll send it off to them. So the way the internet traffic actually works is kind of similar to the way the phone calls work. Now, how did the internet come in? Uh, Leo Hannafin, who isn't here, for the few of you that aren't from here, our dean, uh, when I announced this colloquium, he sent me a message saying, why would you give an hour-long talk about that? Everybody knows that Al Gore invented the internet. Well, we're going to get to Al Gore in a, in a little while. Uh, by, by the way, I hate to be a spoiler, but he didn't invent the internet. But since we're going to bring in a guy named B Gore, I figured we had better bring in somebody named Bush. So this is a guy named Van Ever Bush. No relation to the two presidents. I don't, no, I can't imagine. Um, Van Ivar Bush was a scientist that worked on American nuclear research. And uh, at the end of World War II, having spent some time in that endeavor, was looking for something that scientists could do that would maybe be one skosh less deadly than working on nuclear weapons. He kind of, little pangs of guilt there, you know. The politicians had none, the scientists had plenty. And he wrote this book, or this uh, uh, paper rather, let me get this correct. He wrote an article called As We May Think. And it was published, uh, when I get to the citations on the last slide, you'll see where it appeared. It might have been the Atlantic Magazine. It was in the 1940s. And As We May Think was an article in which he envisioned something he called the Memex. Now, he got the technology wrong. He thought this was going to be microfilm. But what he had proposed. I'm going to quote from his paper, a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. That's the internet. Not on microfilm, but that's the internet. Now, on to a guy named J.C.R. Licklider, uh, one of the true visionaries of the 20th century. He died in 1990, unfortunately, just before the internet really took off and became popular. In 1990, almost nobody had ever heard of the internet. By 1996, there were tens of millions of people using it every day. So it was in that half decade that it really became, to use a word that only means this since the advent of the internet, viral. Um, his paper was called The Computer is a Communications Device. Now, we already had computers talking to other computers by the 1960s. He turned it around and said, instead of the computer talking to the other computer, because we need the computers to share information to accomplish a task, why not use the fact that the computers can talk to each other to facilitate us talking to each other?
This is what he wrote in 1968. In a few years, men will be able to communicate more effectively through a machine than face to face. That is a rather startling thing to say, but it is our conclusion. It came true. Now, this isn't precisely an internet device, although mine is and yours can be. I also should shut mine off. Hold on a second. It's 10 of, and I want to have time for some questions, so I'll move through the rest of it rather quickly. DARPA. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, an arm of the US government that existed uh, for the purpose of creating a network that had a topology, a, a way of connecting together, sufficient that it could withstand local disruptions. Imagine that you don't have the outer rim of this wheel. You only have the hub. Every spoke at the other end is a computer. Okay. Now, if some enemy bombs this computer, that doesn't do anything majorly disruptive to anybody else anywhere else in the network. But if somebody bombs the hub, the entire network is lost. One local catastrophe wipes out the entire ability to communicate. We didn't want a topology like that. Now, let's add the rim. Now, it's a little bit stronger. But if you bomb the rim in two places, you've just about cut the network in half. Now, take out the hub, and you're, you're, you're broken in half again. So these are the kinds of topologies that existed up to that time. You would connect one big computer to lots of little computers. The Army wanted something different. The Army wanted a chain link fence. Let's say that I'm a computer is at every corner of the chain link fence. There's a computer there. There's a computer there. If my enemy drops five bombs, and each bomb is capable of taking out one link, if my enemy drops five bombs, can those computers still communicate, or are those computers detached? They can still communicate. Now, imagine just a slightly stronger three-dimensional chain link fence in which instead of the connections just being made in two dimensions, they're made in three, or since we were talking theoretically, in four or five dimensions. Now it would take hundreds of local disruptions to unravel this network. As an example of how well this works, think back to the very first slide, the picture of the fellow in Egypt that gave the interview to Wolf Blitzer. Egypt, Mubarak, went to great lengths to deny internet access to everyone in Egypt because he knew what was going on. He had an entire team of well-armed guys trying to shut off the internet. Failed. We built something robust enough that the government itself couldn't undo it. Look at China's effort to deny internet access to their people. It doesn't work. It's too big and too well connected. Now, there's this apocryphal story that it was built to survive a nuclear attack. It wasn't, but it was built to survive any amount of local disruptions. This is the original internet. It consisted of four computers, one at UCLA, one at Santa Barbara, one at a company called Stanford Research Institute, one at the University of Utah. And no, I don't know how Utah got on that list. Maybe the Utes were having a winning season that year. I don't know. And anyhow, this was just the very original first internet from the 1960s. We're speeding because we're running out of time. This is the log from UCLA on the day that the first internet message was sent. It was in 1969 in September. Uh, CSK, the guy initialing the log, was a graduate student named Charlie Klein. His boss was a guy named Leonard Kleinrock, who's still there, and I talked to him. And this is the only recording of the transaction. They were trying to log into a computer at SRI, and they had to type the word log. And so they were on the phone with the guys at uh, SRI, and they typed an L. And they said, did you get an L? And the guy's all excited, yeah, we got an L. Then they typed an O, and he said, did you get an O? Yeah, we got an O. Then they typed a G, and he said, did you get a G? And he said, no, my computer crashed. <laughs> so not auspicious, but the very first internet message was sent 42 years ago. By 1971, now the, the way this map is drawn is very odd. One of these is in Detroit. Burroughs was down near Wayne State on, uh, I think, uh, 2nd Avenue and Burroughs Street in Detroit. So by 1971, the city of Detroit was connected to the ARPANET. And you basically had a few things in California and a few things in the eastern part of the country. By 1980, even though still the public had never heard about it, it was absolutely huge. The military at this point was just using it to share information with military contractors and with universities doing research for the military. There was no public access to it. Now, finally, we get to the advent of the personal computer. 
This was the Radio Shack TRS-80. The only storage it had was a cassette tape. Remember when there used to be cassette tapes? That was how you put programs onto a TRS-80. You could listen to them. The original IBM 5150, which never would have sold if some marketing genius at IBM hadn't decided to call it the personal computer. Now all of a sudden people wanted them because it was personal. This was important because now for the first time a person in their home or at a small business could have a computer on their desk. And in the early days, how computer users communicated with each other were in things called bulletin board systems. One person of rather geeky bent, we had several of them here, I was almost one but not quite, would own a computer that was a little bit bigger and faster than everybody else's, and we'd hook up several of these modems to them and publish the phone numbers to call in. We had a bulletin board running out of Scheipel Hall in the 1980s was tricky. We didn't have computer cabling in the dormitories back then, so me and Bill Young had to run coaxial cable up the elevator shaft. Because don't recommend ever going into elevator shafts, by the way. Um, but you basically created the system where people could type messages, and the messages would be received by each other, a very early form of email. But you could only communicate with other people that knew the same phone numbers that you knew to call up and talk to these things. Then we start working on what we now call the internet. This is uh, the very first document in a series of documents called the RFCs, Request for Comments. All of these people were graduate students. They had no authority whatsoever. They had to convince the Army and all these big powerful companies like IBM and Univac and Burroughs to do what they suggested so that all the computers could talk to each other. So to avoid getting in hot water, rather than calling these standards or even guidelines, they just titled it Request for Comment. That way, even though I'm telling you what to do, I'm telling you what to do in a way that it doesn't look like I'm telling you what to do. Um, these were the documents on which all the standards were created that now became the Internet. Uh, if you ever, oh, hi, Al. Every April 1st, the Internet Task Force publishes a fake one. And you can go and look up. There's a, uh, a document from 1989, I believe it was, that described a new way of transmitting messages over the Internet. It's called the Carrier Pigeon Protocol and talks about the different problems with it and how it works. And you can go and look that up. Al Gore, I'm almost out of time, but I have to say this much. Never claimed to have invented the internet. However, his contributions as a senator were very significant. Um, Vint Cerf, who's one of the acknowledged pioneers of the internet, said, Senator Gore was the first elected official to grasp the potential of commuter, computer communications to have a broader impact than just improving the conduct of science. Uh, Gore in 1990, one was the primary sponsor of something called the High Performance Computing and Communication Act, which funded, among other things, the creation of the first web browser. So he had a role in it. He never claimed to have invented it, and he certainly didn't. The only big deal with the internet at this point is built by the Army is it's not scalable. And so the final thing that happened to make the internet the internet we have today was this email from the late John Postel to everybody involved with the internet that uh, we were going to take this old technology called the network control program, which the internet had run on since the 1960s. All those routers used this. And we're going to replace it with two different programs. We call them the opposite of this now, but they're just two different protocols, internet protocol and transmission control protocol. Those had the big advantage that those could accommodate hundreds of millions of computers whereas this could only accommodate hundreds of thousands of computers. We had run out. By the way, we're out again. This is run out. We no longer, uh, at a high level, we, there, no, there are no longer any unassigned internet addresses. Now, you had to know a lot in the old days to use the internet. This is a guy named Andy at Santa Barbara sending me a birthday greeting. He had to know how to get to the computer at the University of Albany that I was at. In other words, his computer was connected by wire to a computer in Illinois, the University of, which was connected by wire to a computer at the University of Albany, which was connected by wire to a computer at the Math and Computer Science Department, and then knew my username on that. It was really hard to send emails to people. We had services before the World Wide Web. There was something called Gopher, which is still on the web. Nobody really uses it anymore. This is the guy that invented the World Wide Web, which is a separate topic from the internet. The internet is just the connection of all the computers. The World Wide Web, email, gopher, these things are services that run on the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is like all the highways in the world. 
and, or, sorry, the internet is like all the highways in the world. The web is like you putting trucks on those highways to deliver things to people. The whole idea of the web was based on hypertext. This is from a book by Rex Stout. Hypertext was you have one of these computer terminals, remember that, you have one of these mice. Now you're reading and you get to a word and you go, I don't know what a quandary is. And you can put your mouse on the word quandary and click on top of that word and it will bring up a new screen, it's revolutionary stuff back in the day, that tells you what a quandary is, hypertext. This is a very early screenshot from the old World Wide Web. This is from 1993. This is what, or December of 92, this is what the web looked like. There were about 3,000 web pages. You could get to about 2,200 of them from here. Um, the question people kept asking Tim Berners-Lee that meant he knew they didn't get it was, what's the top page? And so he finally wrote in a paper, the whole idea of the World Wide Web is it doesn't have a top. You can start looking wherever you want to start looking. What's next? Who knows? What's next? We've already had a revolution start on Facebook. Who knows where it will go from here? I apologize for running a little long. I wanted to leave more time than this for questions. It's already two. But if people have a minute and there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. In the meantime, there's my email address if you want any more information. Or you can ask almost anybody in the room for my email address. They all have it. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you the reference works. In case you'd like to consult any of these, this is a marvelous paper. Uh, the Atlantic Magazine still has this available on the web. So if you want to read the original 1945 paper that foresaw the web, um, if you're interested in more detail about the history of the internet, because I've, I've left out a thousand details to try in vain to keep it under an hour, the Computer History Museum has a history of the internet online. If you go into Google and just type history of the internet, it's one of the first four or five things that comes up. Um, so it's working. So any questions about any of this? I thank you all for coming. I apologize for keeping you past due a little bit. It's an honor to be able to present the first of these, and I hope we have many more interesting ones to come. Thank you very much.